Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Carrie Riddick. I'm a professor and the graduate coordinator at the Women and Gender Studies Institute and the co-convener, along with Director Elisa Trotz, of the research seminar um, that we will be running this academic year. We begin by acknowledging the sacred land on which the University of Toronto operates on Indigenous lands and the shores of the planet's greatest, largest gathering of fresh water. For thousands of years, it's been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. Today, the meeting pace of Toronto is home to many Indigenous peoples from across Turtle Island, and we're all extremely grateful to have the opportunity to work um, and to enter into respectful and caring relations and community on this territory. Um, let me extend um, a particular welcome uh, to this year's incoming class of MA students and PhD students. Uh, this first seminar, as everyone knows, has a dual purpose. As ever, it's an occasion to explore and to expand the domain of women and gender studies. But today, we're paying special tribute to Margaret Eichler, um, uh, the founding director of the Women and Gender Studies Institute who passed away on July 8th of this year. Um, as everyone who knows Margaret uh, uh, can attest, she was a formidable person. Uh, it's really difficult to overstate how important her vision and her, the force of her personality was to both the founding and the success of the Institute. Uh, today, we wanna focus on Margaret's intellectual contributions uh, and her legacy to the university and the wider community. So let me share a few words about Margaret, uh, uh, really on behalf of everyone at the Women and Gender Studies Institute. Margaret was Professor Emerita um, at the Department of so uh, Sociology and Equity Studies, um, uh, uh, now Social Justice Education at the Ontario Institute for Studies in Education. Um, and of course, the inaugural director of the Women and Gender Studies Institute at the University of Toronto. Under Margaret's visionary leadership, uh, the Institute was established in 1999 and grew from what was initially a very small college program to an institute that has advanced the field of transnational feminist scholarship. Um, bold and determined and completely undaunted by the bureaucratic labyrinth of the wider university, Margaret laid a foundation for the creation of our freestanding graduate programs, uh, the consolidation of institute faculty, and ultimately the building of a network of women and gender studies scholars, uh, both within and beyond the university. Her legendarily tough administrative style was matched only by her generosity, her collegiality, and what is um, a, a, an incredible sense of humor. Uh, Margaret was born in Berlin in 1942 and received her MA and PhD uh, uh, from Duke University. Um, uh, she received her PhD in 1972, after which she made her home in Canada, where she became one of the early architects of women's studies, uh, beginning at the University of Waterloo um, and then moving on to OISE and the Institute. While at Waterloo, uh, Margaret um, and the University of Windsor colleague from whom we will speak uh, um, here rather uh, shortly, um, Mary Lee Stevenson co-founded the Canadian newsletter on research and women, uh, which itself rapidly evolved into uh, resources for feminist research, a keystone of communication about the emerging research and teaching in then women's studies in Canada and further afield. Margaret's extensive publication record in the areas of non-sexist research methods, new reproductive technologies, contemporary families, and feminist eco-sociology also uh, uh, includes a best-selling children's book uh, entitled Martin's Father. Uh, uh, we would note that for many years, uh, uh, the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada advised applicants to refer to Margaret's publication, Non-Sexist Research Methods, um, uh, when designing studies, and her bias-free framework uh, co-written with Marianne Burke um, uh, uh, and published in the Global Health Research as a very wide international reach as well. Margaret's uh, professional, uh, professional uh, career, including pathbreaking, included pathbreaking membership in a variety of societies, including the Royal Society of Canada, 
and the European Academy of Sciences. She held the Nancy Rowell Jackman Chair in Women's Studies at Mount St. Vincent University in the early 1990s. Uh, her expert knowledge and strategic thinking were invaluable contributions uh, uh, um, uh, to her work on the committee to establish five new uh, university research chairs on women's studies, the coalition to call for a commission on new reproductive technologies. And of course, she served as a consultant to the Canadian Advisory Council on the Status of Women as well. Prior to her leadership role at the Women and Gender Studies Institute, Margaret was president of the Canadian Research Institute for the Advancement of Women, as well as president of the Canadian Sociology and Anthropology Association. Um, and in 2013, she founded ORC, a right to know, an advocacy group of concerned citizens committed to public science that serves the public good. We were all incredibly fortunate to benefit from Margaret's experience her initiative, her humor, and her energy as the first director of the Institute. Uh, in her outgoing statement, uh, 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 um, uh, she uh, wrote the following uh, in the Institute newsletter. She wrote, I believe that the Institute for Women in uh, uh, Gender Studies, and now the um, WGSI, has a solid basis on which to build exciting new endeavors. So true, and frankly, perhaps even a little understated. We are all deeply indebted to Margaret for the solid and vibrant institution she's left behind to carry us forward. Um, let me tell you uh, what's going to happen this afternoon. Um, uh, we have um, a wonderful lineup of people uh, who have agreed to join us and reflect on uh, um, their engagements with Margaret over time. Um, I will introduce them in a moment. Uh, and I also want to mention um, that we uh, have set up a, an online memorial board um, that uh, will serve as a more permanent tribute to Margaret and her contribution. It will uh, be in her honor on our website. And uh, we would be um, delighted if you would agree to add memories, photos, poems, and videos. Um, uh, uh, we will be um, uh, happy to put them up. Please, of course, um, uh, tell other people about the tribute board and ask them to do the same thing. Uh, you can visit uh, the board anytime you wish, and um, you can find uh, the location of the board in the chat. Um, uh, you'll see it listed there. Um, I'll remind everybody at the end, but uh, I just wanted to let you know this is a work in process, and uh, we look forward to your contributions. Uh, Okay, so the speakers today uh, will begin with a few words from Elisa Trotz, who is, of course, the current director of the Institute. Um, uh, uh, she will be followed by Mary Lee Stevenson, who uh, was a very uh, early collaborator of Margaret's at the University of Waterloo and one of the earliest feminist uh, scholars and teachers in Canada. Uh, she's had a quite varied and interesting uh, career that includes um, uh, work as a researcher on the Canadian Advisory Council on the Status of Women, but also um, uh, 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 work as a consultant. Um, uh, she's a birder. Um, uh, she may, in fact, tell you much more. Uh, after Mary Lee speaks, um, uh, we'll hear from Murphy, uh, um, our colleague, um, um, at the Institute who has herself uh, a long history um, uh, with Margaret, um, stretching back, I believe, to the time that she was a student. Um, then uh, we'll hear from June Larkin, um, a recently retired and beloved colleague um, who uh, was also a very good friend of Margaret. Um, then we're delighted uh, that Sharza um, Mojab, the director that followed Margaret at the Institute, um, will speak. Um, and uh, our very last speaker will be um, uh, a good friend of Margaret um, and poet um, uh, Sohela Pasha. So after the speakers, we will finish uh, with an official presentation of um, Margaret's official portrait. Um, and then I will open the floor uh, to probably 20 or 25 minutes of um, uh, um, uh, conversation um, uh, reflections from those of you in the audience who wish to speak, 
um, uh, um, you're very welcome to put your comments in the Q and A, um, uh, um, and we'll um, uh, we have people here who will keep an eye on those. But I should say that anyone who wishes to speak and doesn't mind being on camera, because we are of course being recorded, um, should put their name in the Q and A, and we will arrange to promote you uh, 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 so that you can appear as a panelist and speak as well. So uh, uh, we hope to finish up with uh, just a very open and free-flowing conversation um, about Margaret. So uh, at this point, maybe I can hand it over to Elisa. Great. Thank you so much, Kerry. And thank you to everyone, and especially to Margaret's, uh, fa Margaret's family members and friends who are joining us this afternoon for our, our, our tribute to her. Um, given Margaret's own practice to not shy away from hard questions or the difficult work that answering such questions fully entails, it seems appropriate timing that we're actually gathering today to pay tribute to Margaret Eichler the week after the Canadian Association of University Teachers censure of the University of Toronto, a censure that our institute fully respected was put on pause. As many of you know, 2021 marks the 50th anniversary of the first women and gender studies courses taught on the campus of the University of Toronto. And in three years time, 2024, we arrive at the 50th anniversary of the inauguration of the undergraduate women and gender studies program. We have actually begun to tell some of these stories. There is no one history, there is no singular story there's no linear narrative. And, and Margaret, the first director of the newly established Institute in 1999 is a key figure in so many of those threads. In what I briefly offer today, I wanted to share one of those threads, which starts for me um, on a personal note in 2000 with my appointment jointly to Women and Gender Studies and what was then the Sociology and Equity Studies in Education program over at OISE. This was one year after Margaret arrived as the inaugural director of, of WGSI. And she was also my colleague at SESC. So I would have her in program meetings on one day and then she would be in program meetings um, on, on another day once every month. And hopefully when we open for discussion, we might hear from some of her OISE colleagues as well um, or on our memorial board. At WGSI, Margaret's leadership was central in the discussions that preoccupied us for those four years of her tenure with us. Discussions that would lead ultimately to a curricular focus on explicating and troubling a transnational feminist analytic. And I just wanna make three very brief points aware that there are others to speak here. The first one is, you know, remembering a curricular meeting in Wilson 2008 in New College and Cheryl Nestle, who was an incredible instructor teaching in our program at that time, brought a copy of a book that was just published in 2001. In fact, this is its 20th anniversary. It was called An Introduction to Women's Studies, Gender in a Transnational World by um, Karen Kaplan and Indipal Gruel. To cut a long story short, we ended up adopting the book as our primary course text for our introductory course, WGS 160Y. And with Margaret's enthusiastic support, we secured a teaching grant from McGraw-Hill that enabled us to build the courses and the program's first course website with teaching resources. That was way back in 2002. And Hygen Park, who is now a tenured professor in sociology at Brock University, was actually the researcher for that website and just did some amazing foundational work on it. Second point is that colleagues also began embarking on conversations about what it meant to think of the transnational. Lindsay Manicum was one of the central players in those conversations. What was it and how might we map its varied itineraries? It wasn't that Margaret was fully on board or fully understood or got everything we were doing, but she was one of our most enthusiastic supporters. Was transnationality perhaps an analytic and method that could be of use for our undergraduate program? in our discussions about developing our MA and PhD programs? Would it enable us to make meaningful connections across the temporal and spatial dimensions of our own research in the Institute from those of us doing work in this settler colonial context to colleagues doing work in India and in South Africa and various parts of the Caribbean? How did it hold us together? What might it leave out? Although I, I have to say that we were so excited by the transnational analytic that this later question about its own aporias came later to us. 
To help us work our way through these questions, we launched an incredible series called Transnationality, Gender and Citizenship in the 2002-2003 year. The final speaker was Angela Davis to a packed convocation hall and Inda Gruel, who was co-author of the undergraduate text that we adopted, also joined us in Toronto. It was Margaret's support that made this happen. I remember her um, cornering the provost at the time, Shirley Newman, and getting her to attend one of our program meetings where we were invited to lay out our vision. And in fact, the provost committed more than a quarter of the funds on the spot that actually got the ball rolling. For the next four years, we would host two keynote lectures a year, each of which was accompanied by a workshop with pre-circulated papers and meetings with graduate students. And all of this was really indispensable to the shape that our proposal for the standalone ME and PhD programs would take. And thirdly and finally, this work would lead to the recruitment of one of the speakers from this series, our beloved um, Professor M. Jackie Alexander to WGSI. We never anticipated this when we began. It was the space that Margaret had really opened up for us that offered Jackie a sense of what might be possible for her as the senior scholar whose work had been so important to our deliberations in Toronto. Margaret was just determined to make this happen. Endless meetings on the phone. Some of our colleagues will remember her ordering us to her house to strategize and deliberate. She put in the time and the care and the work that really demonstrated the kinds of relations that can make a space into a beautiful place of belonging. We have in her honor and in her memory, this actually began um, years ago when she, after she had left the Institute, um, the Margaret Eichler Leadership Award. And we're going to be putting the link in the chat to invite you to contribute to keep it going. In the past two years, that award has gone to two of our incredible graduate students who have um, led the Graduate Student Union, Binta Bajaha last year and Sam Sanchanal this year. And Margaret actually learned that Sam had um, received this year's award before her passing. We are so grateful to Margaret Eichler for offering us a model of leadership that holds space for the work we were trying to do some two decades ago, for the irrepressible good humor, that laugh with which she met any challenge, her undeterred approach and her dogged determination. She always refused to see the glass empty. I can almost hear her saying, let's do it. That orientation is really indispensable for us at WGSI as we navigate this, these incredibly challenging times with community, with commitment, and with purpose. For me, that is the gift and the legacy that Margaret has left us. Thank you. Elisa, thank you for those incredible words. Um, Murphy. Uh, can I call on you at this point? Uh, Murphy will speak uh, uh, on the topic uh, with and against the state. And Murphy, I think you have some slides that you want to put up as well. Yeah, I'll put them up in a moment. Thank you, Carrie. Um, so I'm really um, happy to be invited to speak at this event today. Um, like uh, Elisa Trotz, I was hired right at the beginning of um, the formation of the WGSI Institute the year after. And um, Margaret was the one who hired me and helped set me um, up here at the University of Toronto. And we became um, good friends and uh, colleagues and ended up getting into some um, interesting collabor political collaborations together over the years. So I want to talk a bit about some of those collaborations. Um, my field of research is feminist science and technology studies, and I also work with environmental data justice. Um, so environmental studies things, data things, science things. And um, Margaret was always someone who really cared about uh, environmental justice. So the first thing that happened when I was hired here is we started geeking out talking about science. And she said, let's swap to science fiction books. And, uh, you know, kind of just start building our relationship that way. So here's the two books we swapped. Uh, I gave her The Dispossessed by Ursula Le Guin, written in 1974, which is about a scientist who was working on a kind of anarchist revolutionary moon, um, but needed to go down to a capitalist planet 
uh, nearby in order to complete his physics. And so the book was a lot about, you know, the dreams of doing science uh, in a revolutionary manner and the ways that um, capitalism and um, liberal democracy um, became spaces that were hostile to doing science. And then uh, Margaret gave me a book by Starhawk, The Fifth Sacred Thing, written in 1993. And this book is about um, a post-apocalyptic um, eco-feminist book set in Northern California, where um, a, a ecotopia is made, uh, run by a council of wise elder women who are guided by their um, dream and singing work. So uh, we read these two books, we came back to discuss them, and um, we each hated each other's book. So that was the most interesting thing about it. Um, but it was funny, and I'm going to get back to um, uh, it in a moment, uh, um, that you know, one book was about a utopia, um, completely post the state, and the other was about wrestling with doing science in relationship to um, the state and capitalism. So the work that um, I want to honor here is Margaret's long-standing work around the politics of science. And you know, Carrie mentioned um, the work she did with the um, BIOS framework, her work on non-sexist research methods, which were, which showed her investment in the conditions and practices that might produce valuable social science data. So in um, the, um, so when, the, how I came to connect with Margaret on this was during the Harper years. So. Um, so many of you here will remember that before there was Trump um, doing things with environmental science data um, and social science data and defunding the sciences, um, there was uh, Prime Minister Harper who did something similar. And Margaret started this organization, Our Right to Know, which is hilariously called ORC. Um, and uh, this was a group of um, mostly actually academics from around the, the area um, who collaborated with other groups regionally around the question of the muzzling of science, the defunding, particularly of environmental science and social science, um, and the um, refusal of informational request, requests for data from scientific studies, particularly about climate change, she formed a network of like-minded organizations. Um, and importantly, she did this task, which was incredible. She, um, be beginning I think as early as maybe 2006, she started a timeline of domestic and provincial as well as international um, examples of the way the state was muzzling scientists, was defunding climate change work, was um, redacting climate change or environmental findings, was defunding environmental science, defunding libraries, defunding the census, defunding social sciences, and so on. So this list was gigantic. So here's just like some examples from early on in, in 2006, she started you know, following what was happening with Environmental Canada and um, scientists in the early days not being able to even talk about climate change. She was like, just making these, um, following like all every cut that would be made at a federal level. This list goes on and on. By 2012, you know, it was, you know, if you go to this website, you will just see like item after item after item of things she was tracking and surfacing. Um, and, um, you know, it just really went on and on, including things like the declaring of um, environmental justice folks as being domestic terrorists. Um, she created um, kind of petitions that she would try to get um, uh, people who were running for office to sign to, to commit to um, resisting these kinds of efforts that were happening to defund particularly environmental science and social science. And at the same time that this was happening, um, of course, um, so were other kinds of uh, protests about um, 
the, the Harper administration's approach to um, environment, particularly, and folks may remember, Omnibus Bill C-45. So the Harper government making this gigantic bill where they shoved all sorts of things in that um, basically took away many, many um, environmental protections, including the Navigable Waters Act and taking off most of the fresh water in Canada off the list of protectable waters. And this omnibus bill was a really important flashpoint for the formation of Idle No More as a movement. And so when we think about these two organizations, these two kind of responses, Idle No More, which is a response to, um, um, uh, towards the resurgence and preservation of Indigenous jurisdiction and sovereignty against ongoing Canadian state complicity in environmental injustice. And ORC, which was um, an organization that was kind of with and against the state, seeking to critique and follow and, um, and expose the state's complicity in environmental violence, but at the same time, hoping to enroll um, politicians in um, a stance against those actions. And you know, in my own work, thinking about these questions, um, I felt really caught between both ORC, which I went to many, many meetings of, I helped set up their website, I spent so many hours at Margaret's dining room table with others um, doing this kind of work, and um, work that came out of, I don't know more, um, land defense work. And in particular, you know, this is just like a little chart from some of my own uh, research in Chemical Valley that tries to show here, yeah, this is a chart about the emissions um, reports that the Imperial Oil Refinery gives to the federal government. And when we investigate the data that refineries give to the federal government, we found out that 87.5% of the data about pollution emissions are not based on any physical measure at refineries or facilities at all. They are kind of just mathematical estimates. So in this research, I've really come to conclude that environmental data is largely a theater of data um, that supports and hides the environmental violence. And that the data that sometimes we were seeking to protect or preserve um, wasn't always good data, right? It was often incredibly complicit. And so I think the question that Margaret's work um, raises for us and keeps raising is how do we engage the state? How do we be engaged with the state and against the state? And her whole career working in policy, working in bias, working on environmental data, was all about trying to navigate this position of with and against the state. How do we do that in relationship to kind of national um, policies and politics and decolonial politics that um, for which the settler state is always just going to be a problem? <laughs> and then how do we also think about this work about data that Margaret did as being both with and against science. I mean, what I'm saying about bad data is something she was completely aware of. Her work on bias was about that. And so how do we think about the ways that we're engaging um, with and against science data in such as we kind of continue kind of working in Margaret's legacy? So um, I wanted to just end with thinking then again about those two novels and um, how kind of ironic it is that for myself, who's kind of much more on the side of being, um, wanting to dismantle the state, um, uh, I, was, I was giving her the novel about how to do science under the conditions of a state. And for Margaret, who spent much of her career kind of directly engaging the state, she gave me an ecotopia where the state had been dismantled. Um, and I think Margaret would be really happy to see um, the junior colleagues we've hired who work in environmental justice and to see her kind of ongoing commitment to this issue kind of grow and manifest and take up this challenge of being with and against the state, with and against science in different ways maybe than she did, but I think in ways that she would feel very passionate about.
Murphy, thank you for filling that incredibly important piece of the puzzle in um, uh, Margaret's long engagement uh, with scientific matters. Uh, you've made it completely clear how prescient she was um, uh, and how much she had an instinct for the issues that would emerge and uh, would matter. Um, next, uh, we'll move back to an earlier moment in Margaret's itinerary and ask um, Mary Lee Stevenson to join us with some reflection. Mary Lee, over to you. Thanks so much. And I should say, first of all, that I am speaking from the unceded territory of the Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh, and Squamish peoples. And I, <laughs> I'm already feeling a little like a historic artifact here, um, but I'm glad to be here. And I want to talk to you. I, I've, I think the way that we frame our lives, the way that we frame how things happen, very much shapes our lives. And then the activities and the way our lives go shape the frame as well. And in talking about this, I wanna start with a very personal anecdote or story uh, about Margaret. I'll tell you a little more later about the Canadian Newsletter for Research and Women and how that started. But let's just start just really a year and a half or so ago in the Galapagos Islands and in mainland Ecuador. Um, one of my other lives is as a naturalist, a birder, a photographer, et cetera, et cetera. You can always ask me for my Facebook. But Margaret always wanted to go. She was curious, as you would know, about everything. She learned, learned, learned. And she knew that I'd been to the Galapagos a number of times. And so she wanted to go. This was May, April of 2018. She wanted to go, and we began planning actually about January of that year. And she wanted to go with me. And I was very touched by that because I have written a book, a guidebook to the Galapagos. So I was a, a logical choice, but she wanted to not go in any other way, but to go that way. And I will say, because we've spoken of her generosity, she paid for a lot of it because there was no way I could have managed for an 11th trip that way myself. So we go there and um, about the whole trip was about 10, was 14 days. And I noticed when decisions were making being made, even small ones, you know, the guide might suggest that we go here somewhere today, or may tell us it's going to be, the weather's going to be bad, we should do so and so. And this is true on the mainland or in the boat in the Galapagos. Margaret would say, that makes sense. And she wouldn't say, oh, yeah, that'll be good, or I'm going to like that, or that'll be fun, or I'm scared to death. She would say, oh, that makes sense, or that it didn't. And that was a theme throughout. I mean, I just kept hearing that. I don't mean repetitively or boringly or anything, but that was the way she framed and, in a sense, understood everything. <laughs> and, and, and to me, it was striking because I'm used to people saying, oh, that's good, I'm going to do that, or I don't want to do that. But always again, it was that makes sense, or that didn't. So it happens. One of the classics was we were the Galapagos Islands have fairly recently, 10, 15 years ago, made it clear that the overall area is, after all, largely water. And so their whole uh, responsibility, their whole brand, their whole uh, experience you have is very much now water-based as well. And so that means snorkeling, you know, just the old thing over your face and the tube. And so the, the, uh, the, the guide said to us, well, because so th the waters around the Galapagos are so important, visitors must understand that too and must experience that too. So Margaret, I hear her saying, that makes sense. And then we begin, and she hadn't realized that you wear wetsuits. She hadn't realized that the water was incredibly cold. But he explained that we'll all have wetsuits, we'll all have flippers, we'll have a mask, we'll have that. And, she's, and I could hear her saying, that makes sense. And then she got in the water. And it is, let me tell you, it is not paddling quietly in the Bahamas. It is cold, 
there are swells you have to get sort of uh, slip over the side of the zodiac you know, there's maybe one uh, tube little one of those cork tubes that you could hold on to if you want there are other people equally inexperienced and it, it her equipment need i say did not work she was given one that didn't she gets into the water so keen because it made sense to get into the water and is nearly you know is snuffling this stuff you know at the salt water it's just a terrible thing so then she she manages there are in the memento um, um, pictures at the end of this presentation a couple of stellar uh, pictures of her there in the water and then the next day I, it, they're explaining to us again now we're going to be in such and such a cove there's a lot of currents but we're having two two staff members to each of you so we should be okay and of course i hear her saying that makes sense what i'm saying is not me i'm not going i've done it before i'm not doing that again and uh, you know so i i get to go in the zodiac and the captain drives me around i get to look at penguins and stuff but she's out there working away working away at it every decision then that she made always was that makes sense and rarely that didn't make sense if the and rarely did that follow on not doing something because you've already spoken people have already spoken about her determination and just force of will for herself and for others and that was certainly an example and at the last the last day when we were yet again snorkeling she said to me merrily because she always pronounced my name like merrily we roll along she said merrily I'm 75 and I've just learned to snorkel. So I thought, I mean, we're we're one way or another telling that same story about Margaret today. But I can move now to the Canadian newsletter of research on women. And we're gonna be having just one uh, share sc uh, screen share here. We just pause for a moment. Okay. Because you know there's a gigantic archive of both the newsletter of resources feminist research of all of Margaret's research those of her her colleagues and her students, so if you look at this closely, this was May 1972 Margaret Eichler sociology Waterloo me Windsor and. Um, it, i'll tell you just a little teeny bit we won't need this uh, this slide now uh, Joanne if that's okay okay. Um, Margaret and I came to Canada about the same time. She was at Duke, at Duke, as you know, she was a Woodrow Wilson fellow. She and her then husband both were. And so she had gotten her job at the University of Waterloo and was already a busy researcher, a busy worker. And I was at, I had finished my PhD at UBC. Well, I hadn't finished it then. It took me three more years, let's be frank. But um, I had been asked the, to come to the University of Windsor and they were particularly interested in women's studies, because you won't necessarily know this, but in uh, 70, 71 at UBC, where we had, for instance, the, the, shall we say, leadership or collaboration of Dorothy Smith, of Helga Jacobson, there had already been a lot of work on shaping, a lot of discussions on shaping a women's studies course. And there had already then been a volunteer one that happened once a week in the largest of all the auditoriums and people could come to that and Dorothy Smith led it, Helga did, and other people came in and gave talks that lasted, I don't know, six or eight weeks, something like that. And so um, I had some sense of how to do it, of what would need to be done. And so in the job interview for Windsor, we talked about that and they did hire me with that being uh, half of my teaching load. So that's where we were with Margaret at Waterloo and me at Windsor. And it was a very exciting time in terms of women's studies or however one would be calling it as it changed over time. Very exciting time uh, for the uh, feminist movement, though then it was, it was really women's liberation. And uh, I did my PhD, in fact, comparing two different groups um and their application of the ideology of women's liberation and you could do that but working with dorothy smith you're interested in it dorothy says fine um so there was so much going on and generally speaking as people communicated back and forth generally speaking there was a fair amount of i guess we'd call it receptiveness on the part of academia some skepticism some humor 
But overall, again, they were very happy to have someone who would be teaching women's studies. And there were a number of places around Canada where this did happen. And uh, in any case, universities always want live bodies in the seats and women's studies certainly drew them in. And for, so we, we talked, we communicated and we taught. And in fact, at the year at the, I wrote it down here so I could remember it in 1970 even, so this would have been my first year and each of our first years, I was able to set up uh, at the, you know, the learned societies as they were called, the annual meetings of the Canadian Sociology and Anthropology Association in Montreal. We were able to get, or I was able to set up two full sessions on women's studies. And, you know, because the tradition is one hour and a half and that's it. So we had two of those and I, there were six speakers, people whose names you would still maybe re remember, uh, Meredith Kimball, uh, Nikki Strongbog. And it was, it was very varied in terms of what they were addressing. And I will just say that that formed the core of what eventually was, I did an edited volume called uh, <laughs> originally Women in Canada that had uh, extremely diverse uh, chapters in it. And basically the thinking of Margaret, the paper she had done there at the CSAA was and were the foundation of those. So let's just go to, specifically to um, it, when, when things make, made sense to Margaret, there were some principles behind that. And that was that you would learn, you would spread the word, you would share it. It just made sense to do that. And so naturally following on that, Margaret's thinking, and we're back again here in 1970, she's thinking, we must have a newsletter. We must have a newsletter. And so we were going to work together on it. Because among other things, it's only a two-hour drive on my, in my Volkswagen van, of course, um, a two-hour drive between Windsor and Waterloo. And so the newsletter, I'm going to squint up here. It was already on the, on the screen, but it had four goals. We worked that out, that there would be to establish and improve communication among those doing research on women, to um, list and make pe people more acquainted with ongoing research on women in Canada, to highlight women's research on women internationally, and to provide the exchange of ideas about teaching courses on the roles of women. So it was ambitious, but very much made sense. And we worked and we worked and we worked because again, it's already been mentioned by Murphy and it will be by everyone else. Margaret's capacity for work was incredible. And no matter what was happening, because I was up there one time. In fact, as I think it was the first meeting. And so we had not met in person. Somebody, I still don't know how we met. Probably somebody at Windsor saying, hey, there's a woman up there at Waterloo's working on this. Why don't you be in touch? I don't know. But she, she had um, a son. The son, Yentz, is probably with us today. Um, he was about one and a half, I'm sorry, I don't remember, but of the age where they could, you could walk around and they could hold on to your finger or you could hold on to their hand and they could walk. And so that was Jens. And so Margaret wasn't feeling well. So I said, oh, well, I'll take him out. And we went in Waterloo to the local lake, the local park. And for hours, he sat there, he stood there with duck, duck food saying in his gravelly little young voice, here ducks, here ducks. And we had a good time, but when I got back, Margaret was still asleep. And I learned later, she said, no, I wasn't just tired. She had a very bad flu and was running a temperature, didn't let on. I was able to give her a little rest. And the next morning it was back at work. And we collected, you know, I look back at now again, and I, it's not just an aging factor. I mean, how did you do those things in that time? There was no computer. There was no... <laughs> no Google, uh, there's no email. It must have all happened with phone, which you'd have paid for, and, of, and, and with, with letters and stuff. And, but it happened. And I think, again, just what about the process? Did we sort of, I had an electric typewriter, and so did she. Did we just type it out and then sort of um, uh, cut strips of it and run them together? I have a feeling that's the way we did it. And then 
it would have gone, uh, uh, Waterloo was very supportive of her in this, um, would it have gone to a typist? And then <laughs> when, you, when you saw the picture there, I'm asking myself, how did we reproduce it? And how did we distribute it? And I have no idea. And if anybody's in the listeners now and can fill that in on the chat or something, it would be nice to know because I cannot grasp that. And, and certainly if you were doing it now, well, it would still be a lot of work, but this was really, I mean, that's why I say that I am a historical artifact and that this whole process is, and yet it got done. And I have to say, absolutely, it got done largely by Margaret, who liked to share work, but she carried the ball all the way through. And then uh, Margaret, as you know, moved to OISI, eventually U of T, where she also there received considerable support, but she also had graduate students, had teaching assistants, all of that being with she sort of the center of this little or big pond and all these concentric circles of people working with her, studying with her, spreading the word themselves, all of them because it made sense to do that. So Margaret snorkeled, she learned, she communicates, she shares, and all of that put together is really why we're here today, because it all made sense to Margaret, as I think it does still for all of us. I thank you. Mary, thank you for that. Um, and what a wonderful way to encapsulate how Margaret moved through the world and how she got things done. Um, uh, fantastic, absolutely fantastic. Let me call now on uh, June Larkin. Uh, um, I, June, I have to still call you our beloved. Okay. Uh, so now I'll turn my video on. Okay, good. Can you see my slides, Carrie? I can. I can. Great. Great. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, I am going to speak about Margaret Eichler as a scholar, a mentor, and a friend, because I knew her in all of those ways. I was fortunate, I'm going to tell you a little bit of story about how I came to know Margaret and what she meant in my life. I was fortunate to be a graduate student at OISE from 1988 to 1993, when I was a center of feminist scholarship in Canada and beyond. Margaret Eichler, internationally renowned sociologist, was one of the feminist icons that made OISI my number one choice for graduate school. I was thrilled to be admitted. As a student rep for the OISI Women's Center, I was invited to attend a committee meeting where I knew Margaret would be present. I brushed up on my feminist lingo, put on a drab outfit, which was the feminist fashion of the time, so I thought, and sat eagerly at the meeting table waiting for my icon to arrive. I was both nervous and excited to meet Professor Eichler and other feminist luminaries who are paving a path to what has become women and gender studies today. Margaret entered the room with her signature galloping laugh as Alyssa so accurately describes it. She wore a flashy, multicolored, multi-pattern sweater and didn't look drab at all. But when the meeting started, she was all business. As always, there was a discussion about the lack of support for the Women's Center and the collective exhaustion of trying to keep things going. Margaret volunteered to draft a scolding letter to administration, and then we took a quick break. When we returned 15 minutes later, Margaret was sitting at the table, letter in hand. She had returned to her office to write it up while the rest of us were having coffee in the cafeteria. And those of you who have been on the receiving end of a Margaret Eichler scolding will know that the Dean was in for it when he got this letter. But such a bold and efficient working style matched with boundless energy and a wicked sense of humor is what made Margaret so successful in establishing the Women and Gender Studies Institute in her role as our inaugural director. Since her passing in July, there have been many tributes to Margaret. She's been described as brilliant, pathbreaking, visionary, daring, persistent, generous, and yes, stubborn, all true. I'm going to add to these descriptors by reflecting on my personal connection to Margaret and her, my roles with her as scholar, mentor, and dear friend. As a graduate student and then a colleague, I was inspired by Margaret's scholarship. Sorry, just a second. 
I'm trying to move this to the next one and it's not going. Oh, sorry, there it is. Okay, great. Um, in her groundbreaking book, Families in Canada Today from 1983, she argued that we need to, quote, free ourselves from the monolithic notion that families have a particular structure and instead operate on the assumption that the structure of families is and always has been fluid. Almost 40 years later, the concept of fluidity has become part of the lexicon of women and gender studies. Margaret was one of the pioneers of feminist scholarship who destabled fixed and politically imposed structures and categories. I had a direct connection with Margaret's scholarly contributions through my teaching when I first came to women and gender studies, known then only as women's studies, in 1990 as a TA for the course Scientific Perspectives on Sex and Gender. At the request of the Social Science and Humanities Research Council, or SHRC, Margaret had collaborated with Jean LaPointe to adapt her important book, Non-Sexist Research Methods, into the booklet on the treatment of the sexes in research, made available at no cost, and I repeat, it was free from SHRC, with an urging from SHRC for researchers to, quote, consult the booklet when present, consult the booklet when preparing submissions to the council. This says volumes about the significance of Margaret's work. I was able to get a set of booklets for our entire class, 160 students, and we used it as a course text. In the forward to the booklet, the SHRC president notes that this topic, and that was the topic of non-sexist research, produced, quote, more than the usual amount of debate. And he thanks the committee members for, quote, shedding light while dispelling heat. I'm trying to imagine what went on in the room. The claims in the booklet are hardly considered controversial today, thanks to scholars like Margaret who moved the field forward, often in the face of resistance and hostility. For those pushing the field further in the context of today's tough issues, Margaret is a shining model of the gains that can be made with vision, determination, collaboration, and lots and lots of parties. The short booklet grew into the bias-free framework Margaret developed with Mary Ann Burke, and Carrie talked about this in the opening statements, which was published to the Global Health Research Forum as a tool to address issues related to health and human rights. Now, this is only one example of the wide international reach of Margaret's work. All of this earned Margaret many scholarly awards, including membership in the Royal Society of Canada, and the European Academy of Sciences, just to name a few. In the photo here, Margaret is pictured with her sister, Irene, after receiving an honorary doctorate from Brock University in 1991. Most notably, the honor of Royal Society of Canada is bestowed to, quote, distinguished Canadians who have made remarkable contributions to the arts, the humanities and the sciences, as well as in Canadian public life. This final phrase, contributions to Canadian public life, is a perfect descriptor for Margaret, who is committed to doing socially transformative research. Our required third year research course today in women and gender studies is titled Making Knowledge in a World That Matters. And this captures what Margaret's scholarship is all about. As our first director, Margaret launched IWGS with celebration and scholarly heft by organizing the Institute's first international conference, Feminist Utopias, Revisioning Our Futures in November 2000. For Margaret, engaging with utopian possibilities at the dawn of a new millennium that collided with, that coincided with the birth of the Institute was a way to underline the vigor and relevance of women and gender studies as we entered the first decade of the 21st century. Utopias are intended to bring about shifts in consciousness by providing critiques of the status quo, but they are also transformative, providing alternative ways of thinking and a space for evoking social change. For Margaret, this is what the Institute is all about. The papers published in the book that followed from the conference that I have displayed here, this book, take up some of the themes and issues that have been advanced further in women and gender studies over the 20 years since the Institute was launched. Ironically, as Margaret noted in the introduction of the Feminist Utopias book, 
The word utopia literally means no place. Something she describes as a delicious, described as a delicious irony, given the struggle to have women and gender studies recognized in the academy. In her typical remarkable way, Margaret turned no place into a vibrant and dynamic place with endless possibilities. To do so, she built on the work of the women's studies founders, Sita Rampahala Wansing and Kay Armitage, who nearly 50 years ago put out a flyer announcing the establishment of the program, although it had never gone through any kind of administrative approval process. That's not how we do things around here, said the Dean when Sita and Kay were hauled into the office, but too late, there it was. Following the formation of an official committee chaired by Joan Foley, a recommendation from CETA, their proposed program went through the bureaucratic hoops. A minor in women's studies was approved in 1974. Joined by Catherine Morgan, Mary Nyquist, and Sylvia Van Kirk, this fiery feminist duo added women's studies to the UT academic roster and kept it going until a provostal review called for the establishment of the Institute for Women and Gender Studies in 1999. Margaret took it from there. And here we are today, an internationally renowned institute thanks to the work Margaret did to entrench our place so firmly in the academy. We'll hear more about Margaret's administrative contributions in other presentations today, but I wanna end on a more personal note. I was part of the admin team when Margaret became our first director. My icon then became a colleague with whom I shared a vision for WGSI, a mentor who guided me through, or even better, around the bureaucratic hoops of my administrative position, and a dear friend who taught me how to find joy even in the most difficult circumstances, personally and professionally. For example, this is what Margaret wrote to friends and family as she was dealing with her illness and facing her mortality. For my entire life, spring has sprung. First it was not there, then it was. Not so this year. This year I am living spring. I'm acutely aware of what flowers are out, the different timetables with which trees put on their greenery. My neighbor's maple has not only grown all its adult leaves, but has already lost its blossoms, while my tree puts, away, puts out its first shy buds. It is lovely to experience spring in this way. I was blessed to be part of the circle of friends who walked with Margaret on her final journey in the world. When I last saw her at Bridgepoint, a few days before she died, Margaret appeared unresponsive. But when I began sharing my retirement travel plans as a way of interrupting the silence in the, roo in the room, she startled me by giving thumbs up or thumbs down to various places on my list. This response was so Margaret alive and engaged until her very last breath. It is a fortunate few who meet someone who becomes a lantern to lead them in their life path. I am one of the lucky ones. Thank you, Margaret, for teaching me so much about living, but also for teaching me so much about dying and for the beautiful work you did to build the Women and Gender Studies Institute from where we honor you today. Thank you. June, thank you so much for that incredibly moving uh, set of remarks about Margaret. Uh, wonderful to hear. Short said, um, short said my job, the uh, director who followed Margaret, um, uh, of course, a professor at OISE um, and a beloved and enduring friend of the Institute. Short said, can I ask you to join us? Sure. Thank you, thank you everybody. It's amazing uh, to listen to all of you and, and uh, hear what you had to say uh, so far. Thank you, Carrie. And Joe and Elisa, many thanks uh, for bringing us all here today. I uh, truly uh, wish we could have been in the presence of, in, uh, of, of each other in reality, not virtuality, to share our grief, reflection, moments of, of joy and laughter, and those moments with Margaret uh, where she stirred some challenging thoughts 
and while she was thinking through social and institutional matters. Thank you, everybody. I vividly remember the moment that I received the phone call from Margaret. Uh, her distinct voice still reverberates in my ears. She literally summoned me to her office, though also promised a cup of coffee by saying that my term as the director of the Institute is coming to an end and I would like to invite you to consider it. I was flabbergasted, muttered some words and she interrupted me and added, it is about the people and not the institutional bureaucracy. The rest is known to some or most of, of you, but Margaret was absolutely right. The directorship of the Institute was and is about people. She brought me to a remarkable group of, of colleagues, which also gave me the opportunity to forge more than a decade long close relationship and friendship beyond the boundaries of the institutional structure. While she was using her lovely charm to entice me for the directorship position, her phone rang. It was a quick conversation. And she turned to me and said, Did I tell, didn't I tell you that this is a marvelous place? You know, that marvelous was one of her favorite words. And I heard it many times. It is not official as yet, she continued. We are blind planning to bring Professor Jackie Alexander to the Institute. Alyssa mentioned all that process, but in, in passing, and I think we all have a lot to say about that particular moment. This, as Margaret put it, the marvelous news made me both anxious and elated of entering an institution which was outstanding, with outstanding feminist scholars, and, and a visionary uh, leadership that it is, is leaving behind much to be done. But I knew Margaret decades before the day that she called me into her office. It was when I came across her groundbreaking book that um, all of you have mentioned, Non-Sexist Research Methods, A Practical Guide, which was originally published in 1987, soon actually after I arrived in Canada as a political refugee. I had a part-time job as the director of the Students' Women's Center at the, the then Ryerson Polytechnical Institute. The story and the politics of my appointment to that position as a newly arrived political refugee from a so-called Muslim background is fascinating. A politics of identity, which is hunting us to this date as we are witnessing the grip of imperialist powers on the lives and, and, and the livelihood and the struggle of Afghan women. Um, I leave the entirety of, of, of that uh, story uh, for another occasion, but a task that I initiated at the center was compiling resources for faculty members to address race and gender equity in their classrooms and their research. Some of you may recall that that was the era of, of the state-run equity matters under the 1984 Federal Royal Commission on Equality in Employment, led by Rosalia Bella and, and, and academic institutions had to comply under the federal contractors program. Therefore, the act of resource collection was considered as an institutional act of support or a, stay, a step towards compliance with the state. After decades, we are still grappling with the same topics, though there has been some metamorphosis in the essence of these matters. Anyhow, I came across Margaret's, this practical guide, and in a reviewer, uh, review of, of, of this book, um, I read and I quote, 
Eichler is non-sexist research methods, a practical guide is a tour de force. It should be read by all social researchers. It is very helpful for, gra for graduate students, um, for example, in method courses and others who are actively thinking about how to design their own research projects. Established researchers, especially those who continue to perpetrate sexist scholarship should read this book and mend their ways, though it remains an open question how many of them can be persuaded to do so. Eichler goal is non sexist research, not feminist research, but I think this work should also be studied seriously by women's studies scholars whose commitment to feminism is absolute. The end of the quote. When I joined OISI in 1996, Margaret attended my job talk. She used one of her other favorite words, fabulous, and said, we have to talk more about feminism when you're here. Indeed we did, and our conversation continued even after her directorship of the Institute, especially in the context of a workshop she organized in November 2003 called Feminist Challenges to Knowledge Production by Feminist Scholars. She asked all research participants or the workshop participants to provide the written response to the following questions. What brought you to feminist studies? Who were your allies? What were your major challenges? What was the scholarship you challenged? What was the biggest hurdle? What was your impact on a scholarship? I think profound questions maybe even resonate today and maybe even we should take them up again in the 50th anniversary of the Women's uh, and Gender Studies program at, at U of T and then add um, other uh, questions and ideas to, the, to, to, to them. However, I concluded my submission to Margaret by saying that capitalism and its liberal feminism have finally granted constitutional and legal equality between the two genders. It cannot take more steps forward. The extra legal world cannot be tamed legally and reproduces patriarchal domination. Any feminist position, liberal or post-liberal, must face the challenge. This is what I will call, much like Mohanty, a critical feminist dialectical transnationality. And, 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 and let me stop in, in the middle of my own quote and, and, and remind of, of, of um, Alyssa's uh, description, brief description of, of the launching of, of the feminist transnationality at the Institute at the moment that I arrived at. So I'm not sure though, this is continuing my code, I'm not sure though how much this analytical is sharply different from Marxist feminism, except to say that it probably provides a clear analysis of local, global, diaspora, exile, homeland, hostland, nation, nationalism, and citizenry rights in the era of globalization. But still, we need a deeper revolutionary analysis of capitalism and feminism and, 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 and imperialism by feminists. Margaret taught me about intellectual generosity, about the fact that behind feminist theoretical and methodological wrangling are human beings with emotions, commitments, and ethics that we need to reach to. She reminded me several times when I reached out to her to discuss some challenges of being the director of the Institute, to put the students, the staff and colleagues first. Bureaucracy can survive. It is our relationship that needs our care and attention. It was a colossal task to lead the Institute after such a towering figure, but she left me with 
enough traces, a solid organization with most importantly, fabulous and marvelous people that made it, made it possible for me to continue to build on her work and contribution. I terribly miss her. Thank you, everybody. Sharsad, thank you for talking about the heart of the Institute. Um, and the words you chose are so evocative of Margaret, um, the immense force and clarity of her, her vision. Um, uh, but thank you for, for talking about the people. Um, we're coming uh, towards, towards, towards uh, the, uh, the latter part of our time. And so the last presentation, um, the last oral presentation at least, uh, will be uh, from Sohela Hashan, who is a poet and uh, Margaret's friend. Thank you. Um, I wrote this poem for Dr. Margaret Eichler during the last uh, months of her life to be shared with you on a day like today. And this poem is an emotional exploration of the journey of two close friends. However, for those of you who knew Margaret as an academia, you would agree that Margaret would barely accept things even poetic expressions as is, unless she challenged it from every epistemological possibilities. And keeping this context in mind, I sent my first draft to Margaret and here is her response. Oh, Sohela, thank you. I shed a few tears when I read it, particularly about the bridge. Nonetheless, I do have some comments what or who is a Kramlos and a Remex and a hollow of a journey? I do have a couple of more queries, but perhaps we could talk about them. Thank you, Margaret. And we had lots of conversation about this poem. And here is the final uh, version that Margaret settled with. Write me a poem, Margaret asked. As I delved deep into our journey together, I felt hasty. How could I constrain the decades that our path has passed at the crossroad of the bridge, a step by step, sometimes apart, sometimes on a road without purpose, or when longing for connection into a poem? We have come full circle. We have risen to our dreams and floated like a remix on gravity. To write Margaret a poem, I had to look around and see her through those who were her horizon and those who will propagate her legacy. I remembered the celebration of her birth year after year with noble women laughing their hearts out. The mother Margaret, a compassionate ally, a kind friend, a feminist scholar, and the first director of WGSAI. A stubborn environmentalist activist against muzzling science She's more than words or a poem, she's history. I let my soul float on the surf of her presence, her life significant, like a drop of rain, deeper than marinas, lighter than a speck of dust, sparring softly with one another, turning to a sea, water, raging truth to free women from their exile. Her praxis known to everyone, her words, her horizon, her wit, words, those words that flutter in the confinement of the dark house in serenity. For some, 
She's a researcher and educator, talking red, demanding justice. For others, home, green and safe. A blue calm that once echoed my history when I internalized my oppression under the rain. Rain drenched my body. Rain became a new beginning. Rain was a victory succumbed to the power of a strangled fig. She was hope, falling like rain on the hollow of my journey. Before meeting Margaret, she was confronted the dualities of what appeared as war, justice, or peace. You may then agree that she was a seed nurturing south to the east to north. I often wonder, how did she imagine the possibility of life? Had she ever sung emancipatory songs? How did she reach the bridge, the bridge, our meeting place, our voice, us, and no one else? Let's not to forget possibilities. If the truth dies before us, let's not forget victories. If the possibilities become impossible, Let's record our narratives for a year, a decade, a generation, for tomorrow. And if we depart before the sunrise, let our logbooks ask the darkness of the night for truth. As I write this poem, and as I continue to walk on this path with my memory, I know that what is left of our journey will not be without the struggles. But if I look carefully, if I look carefully, I can see her within and beyond sight. I can see her in you. Those, those who have promised passion will never be defeated. And those who wonder, those who wonder, what if? We are no longer able to hear the sound of the drum that echoes the power of her words, her laughters, her wits. We will always sing together with Margaret on the bridge, our meeting place. Thank you. So Hannah has left us on the bridge um, with Margaret. Thank you so much. Uh, we've just had incredible, incredible reflections. Thank you, Elisa, Mary Lee, Murphy, June, Shartzad, and of course, Sahela again, uh, for all of your reflections. Um, we're going to finish off at this point with um, the presentation of Margaret's portrait. Um, which uh, um, I will leave to June Mark. Okay, I think we're going to put the portrait up, so I'll wait for that. And as it's coming up, I guess I will... Kara, you can hear me, right? We can. Okay, great. Um, all right, so... WGSI has received a gift of a portrait of Margaret, and here it is. It was commissioned from an artist, Holger Majoran, um, to honor Margaret's incredible role in establishing and building the Women and Gender Studies Institute. Uh, the portrait will be hung in a very special place at the Institute, and we can rest assured that Margaret will be keeping a watchful and protective eye on us as we continue to build on the beautiful work that she did in establishing the Institute. 
So I am presenting the portrait today on behalf of the donors. And hopefully when we're all in person again, you can all come by the Institute and you can actually see uh, this beautiful, beautiful portrait um, in real life. So thank you. June, can I ask you, do you know who the artist is? Yes, I said, didn't I say Holger Majoran? Ah, okay, thank you, thank you. Um, maybe at this point I can invite all the speakers to turn their cameras on. Um, and uh, I don't wanna call this the end. I wanna just say now's the moment to open things up. Um, uh, just to reiterate what I said at the beginning, um, we invite you to just join us uh, with your reflections. Uh, feel free to put them in the Q&A if you wish, uh, um, but if you'd like to actually speak, um, we'd be very welcome uh, um, to have you. You're very welcome uh, to do that. Uh, I know that um, uh, some, some of Margaret's Boise colleagues are here. There are many people who I'm sure have things that they might like to share. Um, so, uh, uh, over to the larger world at this point. Um, um, although if, if any of the panelists have anything that they want to add or say in response to uh, uh, what they've heard, um, feel free to do that as well at this point. Uh, can I maybe I should just say the name of the artist again? Um, Holger Mojoran, Mojoran. And maybe I'll spell that if people actually want to go to the website and look at some of uh, their work. Um, Holger, H-O-L-G-E-R, and Majoran is M-A-J-O-R-A-H-N. And then you'll see the kind of work that this artist done and the donors uh, of the portrait commissioned this artist to do the work. Thank you, June. That's great to know. And thanks for putting it in the Zoom. We should have it still up there so that we can all look at it. It's such a wonderful portrait. Um, I can't wait to see it hanging in the Institute as we slowly start to get back there in person. It will be wonderful to have Margaret's presence there. Great. There we go. Wonderful. Well, I'm feeling a little meditative after all of those reflections, which were somehow both uh, very joyous and uh, uh, sobering at the same time. But what a wonderful portrait. And just a reminder that we, you know, June, um, collaborated with other colleagues to put together a really wonderful tribute to Margaret that went out in our newsletter. So we actually have that preserved and it was, you know, circulated by U of T News as well. Um, and we do have this memorial board. So our plan is in addition to this portrait to um, think among ourselves of creating a space on our website to actually have a permanent um, uh, menu tab or space where these tributes to Margaret can be hosted. So. This has been just an incredibly moving afternoon. I know folks are probably feeling as meditative or as moved as, as, as Carrie indicated she is. Um, and so folks may not actually um, be ready to speak today. You're mm -hmm. more than welcome to put your comments on the memorial board, or you can also send us, Joy, if you can put the, um, our amazing uh, admin assistant, Joanne Saliba de Cherry, and Natasha Motluck or uh, Natalia Motluck, sorry, our work study student are here. If you can put the, um, your email, office email in there, Joe, we invite folks to also send us email tributes and we will make sure that those also make it into our permanent um, hosting. So if you want to say something, please rep, uh, register it in the Q&A. And if you're prepared to be on camera, as Kerry said, just indicate that and we'll promote you to be uh, a panelist. In the meantime, Kerry will read some of the tributes as you want and Teresa has come in. So I'll, I'll stop and let Kerry take over. Oh, thanks, Elisa. So um, from Teresa. Uh, who, who says, I will always be grateful to Margaret for her mentoring for me in SESE, um, SJE at OISE. She was an enormously positive force in my learning of ecofeminism and environmental justice education. 
Um, I'll write more on the online boards. Um, and like the rest of us, uh, um, Teresa says she's very moved today. Thank you, Teresa, and thanks. Uh, thanks for writing. When June was speaking, uh, I was uh, um, uh, flooded with memories of actually the, the founding event in November 2000. Um, uh, the people who spoke, I was imagining the space uh, 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 um, in, in which it took place. It's, it, uh, the time between now and then started to collapse. Um, and it, it makes me think that we should somehow find a way to link that um, uh, inaugural event uh, uh, with Margaret's tribute board, uh, uh, so that it's not lost, because it was an incredible moment, um, and one of, uh, uh, in which she played such a central role. I'll just mention uh, that there's uh, a comment, uh, uh, um, uh, an observation from uh, Kate Chung. Uh, it's it's uh, in the Q&A, but uh, mentioning that Margaret also co-founded the Accessible Housing Network, uh, um, uh, bringing other organizations to join with uh, um, uh, older women's networks uh, to cam campaign for housing justice for seniors and people with disabilities. Uh, you can have a look at um, the website. Uh, 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 but I, uh, I think I come away uh, with many, many feelings, but one is uh, a sense of, frankly, awe at the range of activities uh, and interconnections that Margaret managed to both see and mobilize in her own life. Uh, um, it's, it's a quite terrifying set of accomplishments on some level. So we are um, actually uh, at our uh, uh, projected um, wrap up moment. Um, uh, let me thank again, everyone who's spoken today uh, uh, to share such incredible thoughts, memories, uh, uh, poetries uh, in so many different genres. Again, Elisa, uh, Mary Lee Murphy, June, Chartzad, um, and, and Sohela. And of course, the critically important people who uh, made this event happen, uh, somewhat behind the scenes, uh, Natasha and Joe. Uh, these things, uh, these events never happen without an immense amount of labor and coordination. Uh, and I, I'm sure Margaret would want me to acknowledge all of that. And above all, uh, thank you to everyone who has joined us today. Uh, we're, um, uh, we're so pleased you were able to join us today. Um, and uh, maybe I'll just mention that we'd be uh, uh, very glad to see you again uh, at, at, at the next um, uh, research seminars. And this year we've got a particular focus on things very, very uh, close to Margaret's heart, uh, um, feminist knowledge production, as well as transnational feminist activism. Uh, so thank you once again uh, to everyone who organized, everyone who joined, um, everyone who uh, uh, reached so uh, deeply into their hearts and so far back in their minds and memories. Um, good night, everyone.